which is, and that reminds me to tell you that we are going to be recording this presentation. So thanks for joining us. Um, as you may know, many of you, that our organization was founded right after the 2013 flood. And part of that work, as you may have seen, was to um, restore the, the watershed, especially around uh, Chile Camp where the beavers had uh, gotten flushed out of the river. So that was one of our jobs. And now, uh, what is it, nine years later, we are um, starting to get grants and have for the last couple of years for fire mitigation. And beavers are playing a very important role in that uh, respect. Our speaker tonight is Emily Fairfax. She's a um, PhD and professor of environmental science and resource management at California State University Channel Islands. Lucky her. Um, her current research fo focuses on repairing, repairing areas impacted by beavers. So I'll let her explain how beavers can help us with fire, wildfire mitigation. Awesome. And Emily, you might Thank wanna you. tell us more about what you're doing too. Sure thing. So hopefully you all can see my screen now. I'm gonna be talking to you all about how beavers uh, can help us build landscape scale climate resilience. So not just a little tiny spot here and there, but truly something that affects the entire watershed. You might be thinking, okay, I've heard about beavers and I've heard about wildfire, but beavers and wildfire together, like what exactly is the connection there? Most of us would easily say, oh yeah, beavers, they're nature's engineers. We've heard that before. And the firefighter part, it's really closely tied to that nature's engineering aspect. So a lot of the streams in the American West, and especially in places like Colorado and Utah and California and Idaho, Wyoming, Nevada, all these places, they are incised, they're degraded. They are these little simple single thread strings going through the landscape. And they're so narrow and they don't really connect to their floodplains. And so the habitat that they support is also really narrow. Now, luckily, that does not deter beavers from building. They see an incised stream like that and they say, whatever, I can make this my own habitat. I'm nature's engineer. And so they build a dam. And what that dam does is it starts to slow the water down. It's not stopping it. There's definitely still water coming through the dam, over the dam, around the dam, underneath the dam. Uh, it still makes its way downstream, but it's slower. And this little dam, just in slowing that water down a little bit, starts to create a bigger, broader riparian zone. It starts to increase the size of that creekside or riverside ecosystem. And busy as a beaver is a phrase for a real reason, and that's because the beavers don't stop once they built their little dam. They want to expand that habitat, and so they make their dams longer, and they make them taller, and they make them stronger, and they further increase the size of their ponds. And in doing so, that slows the water down even more and it pushes it out into the landscape further. And again, the size of this habitat that they're supporting starts to increase. Now, if you're wondering like, okay, well, why are the beavers doing all this building? That's a lot of work. If you've ever seen a beaver on land, uh, walking around on the landscape, they're pretty awkward. So they are very round, uh, kind of spherical animals. They weigh anywhere from 40 up to 100 pounds. They've got this Jeez. huge paddle tail on their rear end. They've got little webbed back feet and little hands that they can grab with. Like this is not a creature that was designed to walk across the landscape. They waddle. Um, they're like big old chicken nuggets for predators, very vulnerable. But in the water, it's a completely different story. Just like seals or otters or some of these other sort of aquatic mammals we might think about, beavers in the water are extremely agile. They're slick, they're sleek, they're able to quickly swim away from predators. They can hold their breath for 15 minutes. And so the beaver's doing all of this work, not because it's trying to fight fires and not because it's bored. They do it because they need to have a lot of aquatic habitat. So they build their dams, they increase the size of their dams, they'll even go so far as to dig a bunch of little canals that radiate out from their dam into the surrounding landscape throughout the entire floodplain. And each of these little canals that they're digging is like a micro stream or micro river, effectively pinning the groundwater up to the surface and rewetting the entire floodplain. 
And that has a big effect on the landscape. Now, if you were to walk up to a beaver pond out in the field, you might see something kind of like this. We've got the beaver's dam on the left-hand side of that image, and that is a separate structure from the beaver's lodge, which is like a dome of sticks that they live in. The artist here did a good job of showing those beavers on land looking pretty spherical and that beaver in the water looking very uh, sleek and agile. And yeah, like this looks like they're having a big effect, but wildfire is a really big process. It's not something where just looking at this one pond, I would expect a big effect from the beavers. I mean, yeah, maybe this little one pond wouldn't burn, but that's not that big of a deal. But beavers don't just build one little pond. Beavers build a lot of ponds. And if you zoom out just a little bit in the field and start thinking about the scale of their engineering, it's mm. really quite large. It's not just a pond here and a pond there. They will build huge chains and sequences of beaver dams going up and down the watershed, slowing that water down every single one of these dams like a little speed bump. And if you zoom out even further and look down at it from above, you can really start to see the scale of hydrologic complexity that these beavers are building into the landscape. Now, if you already look at aerial and satellite images of beaver ponds all day, you know exactly what you're looking at, um, but maybe that's just me. Uh, and in case you don't, I have highlighted some key features for you. So here in yellow, this is all of the beaver dams that I can see in this satellite image. And then highlighted in blue, those are those canals that the beavers are digging out into the landscape. These are like little water highways that they can jump into and swim away from predators super fast. And then circled in pink, that's the beaver's lodge. So there's just one family of beavers that's maintaining all of these dams, that is maintaining all of these canals. It took one family of beavers to create this amount of complexity in the landscape. And all of that work that they're doing is having a huge effect on how the water moves through the landscape, because again, every single one of these features they build is like a speed bump for the water. And to make that point more clear, I want you to imagine a stream without beavers like what I'm showing you here we're looking down at it from above. And then that stream with beavers a lot more complex where we have the beavers a lot larger riparian zone or that creekside ecosystem where we have the beavers. And when we have the flood period, so when there is a lot of water, whether that's like a true flood like there's a lot of rain or if it's just the peak flow that we get during snowmelt, when flood waves are confined to really narrow channels, they have a lot of power and it's not always a good thing. So those flood waves, they come screaming through these little incised channels, these rivers that are degraded, and they actually will sort of rip away at the banks. It's too much water in too small of a space and it can't get out on its floodplain, which as the name suggests is for floods. Um, and so you wind up having your water actually do a lot of damage to this ecosystem. But once it gets into the beaver pond, it's going to hit deeper water and it's going to hit wider water and it's going to have a whole lot more connection to the floodplain, which lets that flood wave lose its power and spread itself out and slowly navigate this entire riparian ecosystem and go through the floodplain, cruise into the soil, have time to sink in. And then eventually it does make its way downstream, just with a lot less power and a lot more sort of smooshed out kind of way. You don't have this huge flood wave coming through and obliterating your ecosystem, causing all sorts of erosion and soil loss and scouring. Instead, you are spreading out, slowing down and storing that water. And that water storage is super, super important because now think about these two streams again, except now we're looking with depth. We have the stream without beavers and then that stream with beavers. The pond and all those canals, they're definitely having a big effect on the groundwater system. They're storing a lot of water in soil and they're sort of pinning groundwater up at the surface. And in the stream without beavers, not so much. But if it's a rainy period, if we have infiltrating precipitation, if we have water sprinkling down from above and soaking into the soil, it really doesn't matter because all of the plants have water. But well, it's not often rainy and uh, we are in a lot of droughts recently and I feel like pretty much every time I think about this we're in a worse and worse drought and that's where the beavers really start to shine. Because as soon as you take away that infiltrating precipitation, as soon as you take away the rainfall or the snow melt or whatever is out on the floodplain keeping the plants green, then only the plants that can reach soil water are going to stay green. They don't have the option of rain from above, there's no rain. And in that case, when you don't have beavers, that incised stream, it can only maintain the narrowest strips of vegetation and everything else starts to wilt and wither and shut down. And it really feels that drought and you have drought stressed vegetation. Whereas when we have beavers, because they've been storing so much water every time there's a wet period and because that soil is effectively saturated, all of these plants can continue to reach water even during dry periods, even during droughts. And this isn't just something that I think about in theory. 
I studied this in Nevada, in northeastern Nevada, during a multi-year drought, and I found that through all the years of the drought, the beaver dammed areas effectively didn't feel it. If you were looking at their greenness every year, it was the same, as if there was no drought. But as soon as we're outside of that beaver dammed area, you definitely felt the drought. Those plants were struggling. And so, you know, these beavers are effectively stopping the effects of drought in these riparian zones. And whenever I think about drought in the West, what follows after that is fire. Because every time we have a really, really dry season, all of these plants that have shut down and become fuel are really likely to burn. And all you need is one careless match, or I'm in California now, so one careless power line, but regardless of why the fire is starting, anytime there's an ignition, that fire is going to take the path of least resistance. It's going to burn through whatever vegetation is driest and crunchiest and easy to burn. And unfortunately, more and more, that's vegetation in the floodplain. That's vegetation down by the river. In some places, that's vegetation in the river. When our rivers are going dry and they don't even have water in the late summer and the fall anymore, the fires burn right through them. And that causes a lot of damage to the ecosystem. But where we have these beavers, the plants never get into that dry, crinkly, flammable state. They stay green. They stay wet. You don't go out and try to start a campfire with the wettest leaves you can find. That's silly. It doesn't work. We know that intuitively. And it's the same concept here. We don't have the fire burning up these beaver ponds because they're just wet. It's hard to burn. It's easier for the fire to go around or to find a different path through the landscape. And this is not just a conceptual model. We've seen this in the field. These photos are from my colleague, Dr. Joe Wheaton at Utah State University. And he took these of uh, sections of river that did not have beavers and that did have beavers within the Sharps fire in Idaho back in 2018. And without the beavers, the fire would burn down one hill slope, went right into that floodplain, burned through the river bottom in some places, and then burned right up the other side. A lot of destruction here. Very few patches of habitat were left intact. Uh, and from the perspective of an aquatic or a semi-aquatic organism, this was a major blow to the population because the water is now full of ash and there is not a lot of vegetation. There's not a lot of shading. I mean, the places where the fire burned to the river bottom, there's not water anymore. So that was bad. Um, but where we had the beavers, it's a little bit different story. The hill slopes still burned because the beavers are not up on the hill slopes doing work up there. They're pretty much constrained to the floodplain. But down where we had them in the floodplain, it didn't burn. It stayed totally green. We had this huge continuous strip of habitat. And when you zoom in a little closer, you can really see it's the beaver dam. It's the beaver pond. It's all those little canals that are reflecting the sunlight back up at the drone. And you can see how much water is in this landscape. And it starts to make sense why it's not burning. It's really, really wet. Um, but where we didn't have the beavers, it was burning. Even if the stream was a little bit wiggly, even if it looked healthier than a perfectly straightened stream, it wasn't healthy enough. It didn't have enough water stored. And as soon as there was a disturbance like fire, it was not able to withstand that. And so we're seeing this and we're thinking about this and we're like, wow, this is amazing. Does this happen everywhere? And so that's what I decided to study in my first um, sort of foray into this topic. I looked at five different fires in five different states. And at the time of the study, I was like, man, these are the biggest fires. This is a perfect, you know, I'm pushing the boundaries of the beavers. I'm going to find out if they can keep patches green, even during these huge fires. I don't really think they're big fires anymore. We'll come back to that. Um, but what all these fires had in common was there was a lot of beavers and beaver dams within their fire perimeters. They differed, however, and some of them were in pine forests, some of them were in grasslands, some of them were in shrublands, some of them were high slope, some of them were low slope. Some of them had come into it off of a like serious drought year, some of them were coming into their fire off of a little bit more normal year. So with all that variability, what I'm thinking is, okay, if in every single one of these cases, I see the beavers creating these green patches, that means that this is a repeatable and reliable phenomenon. Like this is something we can count on. If it only happens once or twice, then we know there's something else going on here. It's not just the beavers that are making landscapes fire resistant. So to actually figure out if they are making these green patches, I want you to imagine that you are going to all of my field sites and you're walking along the creeks and you go from a designated starting point to a designated stopping point. And you do that at every single creek in my study, the year before the fire, the year of the fire, and the year after the fire. And as you walk along the river or the creek, you're staying as close to it as you can, and you're taking notes on how green are the plants. Are they really green? Are they not so green? Are they burnt? Are they not burnt? And you're also making notes, is there a beaver dam here? Is there a beaver canal? Is there a beaver lodge? Is there something that indicates the beavers are influencing this landscape? 
that's essentially what we did in this project, except instead of actually walking all of these creeks before, during, and after the fire, which is hard because I don't actually know where the fires are going to burn before they actually burn, um, I used remote sensing. So I used satellites to go back in time and to look at these creeks before, during, and after the fires, and I'm extracting the pixels along that river profile. So a little snapshot of the greenness every step along the rivers. And I'm going to show you a little bit of my data from the Manter fire, which was in uh, Southern California. And it was up in a place called the Domeland Wilderness of Sequoia National Forest. It burned back in the summer of 2000, and it was 79,000 acres. I've been there recently. Uh, the beavers are still there. That's a picture of me standing in front of one of the beaver dams, so maybe that's a little bit of a spoiler. Um, but this is an interesting landscape because there weren't a ton of beavers there, but there were a good number. And uh, it's really dry. It is really dry in this area, even though it's got some pine forest in it. It's a pretty dry spot. So I'm thinking, okay, this is a good place to really push the beavers to the limits, see if they can maintain those green patches. So I'm into this fire and I'm thinking, all right, this is going to be great. I'm going to get some good data. But I always do like to keep my research grounded in what it's actually like during these fires, especially because they are natural disasters and they do affect people. So I was doing some reading about the fire and I came across this quote from the LA Times, which I'm going to share with you. It is a humbling expression of nature, walls of flame, 70 feet high, twice as high as the nearest tree, leaping through canyons and valleys at times in five directions at once, left behind quite literally is scorched earth. So this was a big fire. This was a severe fire. This is a fire that has 70 foot walls of flame. Uh, this is a fire that's going in five directions at once. And so this is a fire that is really going to be hard for the beavers to stay alive through. It's going to be hard for them to keep anything green through. This is a really serious fire. But um, I haven't actually shown you any data yet, so we don't know if the beavers were able to do it or not. But just based on this quote, I would say it's a long shot. The data said otherwise, though. So what I'm showing you now on this plot is the plant greenness along the creek profile. So on that x axis on the bottom, the horizontal one, we have the distance you've walked along the creek from zero being that starting point out to past about 3500 being that stopping point. And then the y axis, the vertical one, what I'm showing you is how green are the plants and that's a measure called NDVI or normalized difference vegetation index. A lower number means there's less or fewer green plants and then a higher number means there's more green plants. The dashed yellow line at point three is the threshold where I expect a healthy riparian ecosystem to be above during the growing season. If it's below that, there's either not a lot of plants there for some reason, or the plants are really stressed out either by drought or fire. Now the green curves are the year before the fire and the year after the fire, and then this reddish brown curve is the year of the fire. And marked along the x axis, those little black boxes, that's where the beaver dams are. And you can see for a while, all three curves are kind of the same. They're bouncing along. They're mostly above that 0.3 threshold. And then at around 1500 meters, one of them really plummets that during fire. So well, the fire was actually in this area. It really drops off at about 1500 meters and then it stays below the 0.3 threshold the rest of the time. But before the fire and after the fire, it was okay. So what we're seeing there is right as soon as we leave that beaver complex, we start to really see the effects of the wildfire. We start to see it impacting the vegetation. And to make that difference a little bit more clear, I have taken the difference and plotted it. And so now a lower number indicates that we are being less affected by the fire, and a larger number indicates we are being more affected by the fire. X-axis is the same. It's the distance you've walked along the creek, and those black boxes are still the positions of the beaver dams. So you can see walking along the creek, as long as you're by those beaver dams, there's not really a lot of fire effect. Then as soon as you get out of the beaver complex, we have a huge fire effect. It's not at all small. It's actually quite large. And I didn't just see this in one place. I saw this in every single fire on all the creeks. And overall, in the study I published on this called Smokey the Beaver, uh, Beaver Dam Repairing Corridors Stay Green During Wildfire Throughout the Western United States, I found that the places that did not have beavers burned three times more intensely than the places that did have beavers. And this is comparing river to river. I'm not looking at like rivers compared to hill slopes. These are rivers with beavers and rivers without beavers. If you have beavers, that's three times more protection than if you don't have beavers. And this photo on the slide as well, this is from the Manter fire that I was just showing you data from. And I love it because on the left side of it, we have a creek with beavers and you can see their beaver dam. And on the right, we have a creek without beavers. You can see one of them, burned really severely that 70 foot wall of flame that was twice the size of the nearest tree and absolutely had no problem burning that tree into a little pencil ripped through the stream without beavers 
tried to get into the beaver dammed area, you can see the burn is progressing in that top left corner towards that wetland, and then it fizzles out. It can't burn it. It's too wet. And that's because the beavers have been storing water there for years. And that water came into uh, a lot of use as soon as the fire approached that system. And, you know, these refugia patches, they're interesting because they are staying green during fire. They're fire resistant, but they're also valuable. In this fire, there was a helicopter flight afterwards assessing the damage, and they saw a black bear just hanging out at the beaver pond sitting there. I don't know if that bear had gone there during the fire and waited out the fire in that area, or if it had found that area after the fire and was like, finally, some water and maybe some food. But I like to say that these refugia patches are important because it looks like Smokey Bear is getting a little helping hand from Smokey the Beaver. There's a lot of ecological value to having a patch of the landscape that's not going to burn. And so I did this study and I was like, awesome. Beavers uh, fight fire, they stay green. These complexes are staying totally green during wildfire. I have solved the wildfire crisis, not really. Um, but then the year 2020 and 2021 happened and it became abundantly clear that the fires I was looking at before are not examples of really severe wildfires. We are now in the age of mega fires. And the fires that we've seen just these last couple of years are a completely different beast than the fires we saw in my previous study. Mega fires are defined as a fire with a burn area of larger than 100,000 acres. Now, just because a fire is big doesn't mean it's bad. A lot of fires are actually quite good. Our ecosystems need some amount of fire and we have big ecosystems, so they, maybe they need big fire, that's fine. Um, what does make mega fires bad is that a lot of them get to be that size because they are exhibiting these really extreme fire behaviors that are not part of the natural fire regime. So mega fires, once they sort of reach a certain size, they start to create their own weather systems. And so once that fire gets big enough, it starts to make these clouds called pyrocumulonimbus clouds and pyrocumulus clouds, which are ember and ash spewing clouds and the fire breathing dragons of clouds. And these are like those videos you see during the peak of fire season where there's an actual tornado of fire or where it's a storm cloud and it looks like it's raining, but instead of rain coming down, it's ember and it's fire. And that's a problem because those are going to start a lot of secondary ignitions around the first ignition. So we're going to have all these little baby fires around the main big fire that then merge with the big fire, make it even bigger, which makes it make even more of its own weather, which keeps that cycle going. So there's this positive feedback loop of increasingly large and destructive fire behavior. Part of that destructive fire behavior is that they can get really, really big, really, really fast. And so in some places we've seen spread rates of about 100,000 acres in a day. And that's way fast. And when we think about our own firefighting capabilities, that's hard to get a handle on. That's hard to alert enough people that they need to evacuate for. So that's a problem. We don't wanna have that kind of explosive spread rate when we have fire in the landscape. We wanna know where it's going and be able to track it and make sure it doesn't go into our communities where people are living. Another issue with that really explosive spread rate is that when you have really fast growing fires, they tend to leave just these huge swaths of moderate and severe burning in their wake. And so, like I said, a lot of places need fire and good fire typically will create the sort of mosaic of burn intensity. So you have some, a lot of low burn, so it's just a, like, a little bit of singeing and it's fine and it doesn't really hurt the ecosystem at all. And then maybe you have some patches of moderate and severe and there are some plants and animals that benefit from having a couple of patches of moderate and severe burning here and there. But these ecosystems, especially in the Rocky Mountain region, did not evolve to have huge patches of severe intensity burning and moderate intensity burning. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing with these megafires. And Colorado, unfortunately, um, but also fortunate for my research, in 2020 had two of the biggest fires that have ever happened in that state in recent history, the Cameron Peak Fire and the East Troublesome Fire, which many of you probably have some pretty personal experience with. Um, these were not trivial fires. Both of them were around 200,000 acres. I'm showing you their burn severity maps here, where yellow and red are moderate and severe burning respectively. So these definitely were megafires in size, but they were also megafires in behavior. Um, East Troublesome Fire was one of those ones that exploded super fast. It burned tens of thousands to 100,000 acres in just a couple of days. The Cameron Peak Fire had these really big stretches of severe burning, um, completely wiping out the vegetation on a lot of hill slopes and in the floodplains, which destabilizes that soil and creates all sorts of landslide risk. Um, so they were bad fires in that regard. Um, and they were really big and they were really out of control. And we were really lucky that they burned as late as they did in the year because the snow helped put them out. One thing that they had in common was they had a lot of beavers within those uh, fire perimeters. 
The Cameron Peak Fire had 99 satellite visible beaver dams within it, and the East Troublesome Fire had 512 satellite visible beaver dams. So lots of beavers doing their work within these perimeters. And knowing that this is sort of the current state of wildfire, what I wanted to do was see, okay, well, beavers, they can create these green patches and these refugia during normal wildfires. What about during megafires? What about during these really severe, intense, big fires? Do they still create those green patches? Do they still resist burning? I wanted to use NDVI, that same type of data I collected last time, um, but that actually turns out to be a challenge in places that have real seasons like Colorado does. Sometimes I forget that living in California. Um, apparently in the fall, all of the trees are also changing colors. They're going from green to yellow and then brown and dropping their leaves, which does make it a little bit hard to use NDVI, which is that measure of plant greenness um, to track the fire. So not ideal that these fires burned in the autumn and the winter for the type of data I like to collect, but it wasn't a deal breaker either. Instead of using NDVI, which was gonna have a lot of interference from that seasonal leaf change, I used what's called false color mapping. What I'm showing you right now is true color mapping. So false color mapping, what that does is it assembles bands of light differently than how our eyes and brains would normally do. In true color, which I'm showing you here, this is sort of an approximation of what we would see if I was like strapped to an airplane or a satellite looking down on the Cameron Peak fire. And it's super hard to see. And that's not just because you're on a small computer or a tablet, that's because it actually is super hard to see what's going on in this uh, scene. But in false color mapping, I use different bands of light. Instead of using red and green and blue, we can use infrared, red and green. And then that really makes it apparent which places have burned, and which places have not burned. Here, the red is indicating unburned vegetation. So that dark red is usually sort of pine foresty kind of cover. And then that lighter red is more herby and shrubby kind of cover. And then black is places that have burned. In addition to standard false color, there's also another version called false color urban where you use shortwave infrared one and two, and then the red band. And in this one, orange is burned, green is unburned, but you can also see the hot spots. So there's that little bright patch in the top middle of this uh, image, and that's where the fire is actively burning. And so with these types of data, I'm able to still see what places are burned and what places are unburned without having to rely solely on that NDVI or just the vegetation greenness. So what my team did was we went through these fire scars and we found every single beaver dam, beaver lodge, beaver canal, just from the satellite imagery um, and a little bit of ground truthing. And we marked them all out and we figured out what was influenced by beaver. Then we went and we used this satellite data and found a sort of a picture of this landscape right before the fire happened. So how green was it right before the fire? How healthy was the vegetation? Was it alive? Was it dead? And then we look for the image as close to right after the fire came through as we can. Now with satellite imagery, you don't get an image every day, unfortunately. I get about one per week that's usable. And so sometimes the fire was still there when I was trying to see what it had done to the landscape, which makes for a cool image because you can see there's fire burning on either side of the beaver complexes here, um, but not within it. So this is good confirmation of what I think is happening, but it's not proof that the fire didn't burn because what if right after the satellite image was taken, the fire went right down in there and burned it. So in that case, we look for the next image after that one. I mentioned uh, that I like to use satellite data for a lot of this kind of stuff. And as a remote sensing scientist, I thought clouds were annoying because sometimes a cloud blows in and it blocks everything. Um, but at least those only last a day. Uh, it turns out snow is annoying. So <laughs> it snowed on these fires, which was great for the fire going out. But man, was it a bummer for the data um, because I wanted to see like, well, what happened? Did the fire get into the riparian zone? Did it, did it move on? I don't know what happened. And then the snow comes and the snow covers everything. And unlike a cloud, which blows away the next day, the snow stays uh, and it stays pretty much the rest of the season. So when that happened, I would have to wait until after snow melt and try to get the very first image I could before we start to see all the regrowth of especially grasses that we do see post fire. And try to infer from that what burned and what didn't burn during the wildfire put it all together and I can draw these sort of polygons or patches around the places that are not burning and that are influenced by beaver and those are the beaver created fire refugia. And I didn't just use the satellites because as much as I trust them, there's always something to be said for going and seeing these sites on ground. Now these are from the Cameron Peak fire. Uh, I went out there after snowmelt had happened the following year and checked out the site to see what it looked like. And when you're in the beaver complex, like you really couldn't tell unless you look up at the hill slopes um, that there'd been a fire here. The pine trees were all healthy and happy. They weren't burned. 
Uh, there was all sorts of willow with all of their leaves on it, and there had not been time to regrow that. There's a lot of grasses, which, you know, hit or miss, grass can regrow after fire pretty quickly. And then the beaver lodge was still there, and there's fresh chew on it, and the dam was still intact, and there's fresh chew on it, and so the beavers are doing fine. It looked like they had had some construction projects they were working on out in the floodplain, so it seemed like a totally happy, intact system. The Audubon Society sent a drone photographer up there afterwards, and he took some amazing shots, and you can really see, like, this is a booming happy, healthy ecosystem. Just don't look too far away from the beaver pond. You'll start to see the spoiler of what happened elsewhere. Um, there's an otter that was just like hanging out on the beaver lodge. So clearly the wildlife is still able to use this site even after that fire came through the system. And you're thinking like, well, maybe, I don't know, Cameron Peak fire wasn't that severe right here. Like there were some patches of low burning. Maybe it just didn't have a lot of power when it got into this beaver complex. So it was easy for it to not burn. I thought that too, until I walked just a little bit outside of the beaver complex, still in the floodplain, still in the riparian zone, but then also looking up at the hill slopes. And this fire was really severe right next to this site. Like it was not coming in low intensity. It was coming in high intensity. The pine trees were burnt down to these just pencils. There was not even branches left on them. They're burnt all the way through. Every single plant on the hill slope was dead and gone and burnt to its roots. The trees were crispy, crunchy, crackling like you touch them and the bark bits just fall off. The willow was burnt down into these little nubs, um, so definitely did not have time to regrow um, and was not regrowing outside of the beaver complex. And so the fire was severe, just not where we had the beavers. What really struck me is when you look out at the landscape, when you're looking over by the beaver complex and then you start to look further and further away, you can actually see the transition from high burn severity into fire refugia. So in that beaver complex where we have the refugia, where it's still green, we have sort of three stories of vegetation. We have the pine trees and then beneath that the willows, which are brushy, and then the grasses. Now the grasses regrow everywhere because that's what they do post fire. So they're not actually a good indicator of what happened here. But the willow and the pines are because they did not have time to regrow between when the fire burned and when I took these photos. And when we're over by that beaver complex on the left hand side of the image, the pine trees are totally fine, the willows are totally fine. You start to move to the right, and we lose the willows first. And so you can see the willows have lost their leaves and there's not really that second story of vegetation, it's just grasses and pines, and some of the pines are looking a little bit crispy. And you keep going further right, and now the pine trees are pretty much all burnt or somewhat burnt, keep going further right. Now all the pine trees like the needles are burnt and some of them don't even have their needles anymore. Keep going further right none of the pine trees have their needles anymore they are all burnt from the bottom to the tip top and go all the way to the farthest right and you don't even really have the pine trees anymore they burnt down to these little nubs what was standing had been knocked over with wind it was completely dead so this fire went from seriously high severity burning down to absolutely no burning in just the span of a few hundred yards and to me, that was incredible. That is a testament to how much water has been stored in this landscape to suck the power out of a fire that big. Like if you've ever had a campfire that gets a little bit too big and you're trying to put it out, it takes a lot of water to put it out. Like those embers will keep burning. And here, this was a really big fire and the water stored in the beaver pond was effectively able to put it out. And that was incredible. And I saw this both in the Cameron Peak burn scar and in the East Troublesome burn scar. In both of these situations, the vast majority of beaver ponds did create fire refugia. In Cameron Peak, it was 87% of them had some amount of fire refugia around them. Whereas if I was to randomly select any section of river or creek, it was only 42%. So yes, rivers are less likely to burn, they're wet, um, but our rivers are often so degraded that about half of them are burning and that's not ideal. In East Troublesome, every single beaver dam I looked at had some amount of fire refugia around it and only 56% of those randomly selected creek and river sections did. So definitely a strong preference for those beavers to be creating fire refugia over just a random section of other part of the river. All in all in Cameron Peak, 270 acres of habitat were preserved by these beaver complexes. And in East Troublesome, it was 1500 acres of habitat. Thinking about that as a creation rate, we're looking at about 2.7 to 2.9 acres of habitat being preserved per beaver dam. So that is a lot of habitat that's being kept green and thriving and healthy and alive, even despite having these super severe wildfires around them. In the Cameron Peak fire, most of those refugia were occurring in clumps, so the beavers were a little bit more spread out. Um, there, it wasn't just like continuous beaver damming all up and down the channels. 
And so you'd get these little pockets of fire refugia, and those pockets definitely are not affecting the way that the fire is moving through the landscape. It's very easy for the fire to just burn around them. But in East Troublesome, they were more like ribbons because some of these creeks were burned from their very headwaters all the way down until they met the next branch of the river. And in that case, it did look like, hmm, maybe as the fire got to these sections, it was a little bit of a slowdown point. It was a little bit of a speed bump for it, just like their speed bumps for water, maybe they're also speed bumps for fire. And that's something that we're researching more. We're trying to really understand how much beaver damming or how much river restoration do you need to meaningfully change the way a fire is moving through the landscape? How do you actually get them to make you a fire break? And I wanna emphasize that this is not an anomaly. So this is not something that we just saw once in Idaho, and this is not something that I just dreamed up and made a conceptual model for or felt stop motion for. This is something that is happening a lot. It happened back in California in 2000, and people were photographing it back then, well before anybody was really talking about this as something that we needed to consider for climate mitigation and adaptation. This happened up in Canada in a 1.5 million acre fire, and the colors here are a little blown out on this photograph, so I apologize for that, but the yellow and green is unburned. You can kind of see this purple and black in the nearby landscape that's burned. And what I like about this photo is you can really clearly see some of those beaver canals radiating out into the landscape. And the extent of greenness is really closely correlated with how far those canals reach. And so seeing this kind of thing, I'm starting to think maybe we should be thinking not just about the Beaver's Dam, but also about those beaver canals and where are they being allowed to make these little tiny water highways, because that seems to be a big factor in how much of the area is going to stay green during fire. We did see this in Idaho. That was a really um, sort of famous example of this happening and brought the visual to a lot of people's screens and uh, sort of consciousness as they saw this float around the internet. And they're like, wow, that was done by beavers. So like, look how burnt that landscape is. But the beaver ponds are totally green. And we saw this happen in Colorado in those 2020 wildfires, um, very abundantly clear in both East Troublesome and Cameron Peak that the beavers created fire refugia despite being in some extremely severe wildfires. And Colorado, it's not like out here in California where like everything's burned in the last couple of decades. So you're always going to hit another fire scar to slow down your megafires. Like these places had not had megafires in 100 years, and then they had them kind of all at once, and that was fine. The beavers were still able to create fire refugia. And for a while, I was thinking, well, what if it's just sort of the shape of the landscape? Like beavers like to dam up valley bottoms, and maybe valley bottoms are just really fire resistant. But up in Oregon in 2021, the bootleg fire burned, which is a 400,000 acre fire. And it's a pretty flat landscape, like there are valley bottoms, but not in the same way that we have in the mountains of Colorado. And even in this pretty flat landscape, the beaver complexes were not burning. They were staying super green, intact, healthy vegetation, when everything else around them is absolute charcoal. So this is happening everywhere. This is happening across all sorts of different landscapes. And there's absolutely no shortage of fires, unfortunately. Um, so the research is ongoing. Some of the other fires that my team is looking at right now is the Mullen Fire, which was also 2020 in both Wyoming, and it, it stuck its little toes down into Colorado too, part of that really intense fire season. The Calder Fire and Dixie Fire out here in California from 2021, these were a couple of really big fires that were a little questionably close to each other. The Bootleg Fire, really trying to look into that one as a case study of a flatter landscape that had this happen. And then the Muddy Slide Fire, um, just a little bitty one in Colorado, wanted to take a step back from the gigantic fires and see, well, in these smaller systems, do we get the same kind of effect? And we'll see what 2022 is going to bring. Um, for better, for worse, we are coming into this season with a lot of drought in the American West, and I am expecting to see some fires uh, that are going to be great for studying, but unfortunate for the environment. And hopefully, with all of this data piling up, we can start to be a little more proactive about protecting some of these landscapes and really encouraging beavers and beaver-based restoration to get our rivers and floodplains back into a healthier state so that if and when fire does come through, it doesn't have to be a super incredibly intense destructive megafire. It can be a little bit less and we can get a handle on it a little bit quicker. There are also just tons of questions remaining. So this fire study that I've done and this work that I've done with megafires, all it really did was open the door. There is so much more we need to understand about this phenomenon. It's great to see it happen. It gives me a lot of hope to see it happen. But some of the other things I've been thinking about are so, okay, these patches, they're not burning. What exactly is our carbon savings from not burning that many acres? If they're saving 2.8, 2.9 acres of habitat per beaver dam, how like continental wide or west wide how much carbon is being saved by not burning those acres 
We've seen bears and otters and bobcats and beavers hang out in these ponds post fire, but what else can go there? What kind of plants are being preserved? What kind of animals can seek these places out? In California during the Dixie fire, we have a wolf pack that has GPS collars on it so we know where they are at all times up in Lassen. And the wolf ecologist for the state saw these wolves going back and forth and back and forth between these sites and they were really worried that there'd be a lot of mortality and the wolves had pups and it was like a bad time to have fire. And what they found was that pretty much all the wolves survived because they went to wet meadows and they just hung out in the wet meadows and they waited for the fire to move on and they were safe. And so clearly animals somewhere in their genetics and instincts are able to find wet safe patches and no go there when everything's burning, especially if you can't escape the wildfire. I've also started to wonder how much protection you really need to say okay we could put people there too because with these wildland fires where they're burning away in the back country and they're burning huge uh, it can be hard to access some of these sites and you want to be able to put your gear down and put your people down somewhere where you know it's not going to burn and if you don't have parking lots which is what we use when they're burning in a little bit more urban areas can we use these beaver complexes as a safe place for the hot shots and for all the firefighting gear when you do have these patches of ecosystem preserved thinking about what happens after fire, the rest of the landscape does have to bounce back. So does preserving this little patch in its mature state help reseed that landscape faster? And does it reseed it with more native plants instead of these invasive plants that are really opportunistic and come in post fire? Maybe got to do a lot more field work to understand that one. It's slightly outside the range of my satellite data. We just started seeing a lot of data come out of both Colorado and Oregon showing that post fire these fire refugia actually can help catch a lot of the ash that would otherwise just cruise downstream and smother fish and coat their gills. Um, it's these slow water environments so think all the way back to that first sequence I showed you of that flood wave coming through when it hits that beaver pond it slows down and when water slows down it drops its sediment and so maybe these beaver ponds, if nothing else, they can help stop some of that debris from going downstream post fire. I'd love to be able to model how much restoration we actually need to stop a wildfire in its tracks and under what conditions that's even possible. Um, we need to blend that remote sensing work with a lot more field work and a lot more modeling work, but it'd be an important question to answer because then when you have a watershed, you can say like, we need to get this much restored if we wanna really be protected from wildfire. And some places don't have beaver anymore. Not as much in Colorado, you guys are lucky, you have lots of beavers. Um, but there's other states where we are still really hurting for beavers, even though they're native here and even though they belong. So California is really in deficit, Oregon's in a big deficit. Like there's a lot of absent beavers from a lot of watersheds. So if we wanna bring them back, if we wanna partner with them for river restoration, how do we actually do that in a way that is good for the beavers and good for the watersheds and good for the people that live there? So tons of questions. If you want to read more about all of those speculations and musings and ideas, uh, I just published a paper with one of my colleagues at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, called Beaver, the North American Freshwater Climate Action Plan. And we talk about all the different ways that beavers are helping us adapt to and mitigate climate change and why we think it's actually pretty important that we start working with them more seriously if we want to get ahead of some of these natural disasters. So I'm happy to answer your questions. I like to leave a lot of time in case people want to talk about it or share their stories. I know that these fires are pretty personal for a lot of you. So any questions you have, definitely feel free to ask. And if we don't get to it right now, you can always email me or I am on Twitter constantly tweeting about beavers and nothing else. So uh, you can reach me there as well. So thank you for listening and uh, happy to answer your questions. Hi, Emily, this is Celeste. I am wondering if beavers have a ceiling at elevation where they don't go above to higher floodplains. That's a good question. So elevation wise, uh, in Colorado, the highest beaver dams I've seen are at 12,200 feet. Oh. Yeah, so they're above the tree line. Um, they're in willow bogs, alpine willow bogs. And um, if you've ever hiked Mount Beerstadt or been there, the whole sort of bowl underneath the peak is just absolutely chock full of beaver dams. And when I hiked on those trails, you can see tons of moose hanging out in there and the beaver dams go all the way up to basically the scree line and then they can't dam scree because that's a horrible substrate. Um, but they will they will go really high elevation, way more than I thought they would. Interesting. <laughs> and I wondered if um, those little canals are also used by the beavers to transport 
tree trunks and tree limbs and all that to make their dams? Yes, they definitely are. So one of the main reasons the beavers are digging these canals is they need to get more food and more building material from further out in the landscape. So they'll dig out to a good patch of aspen, especially they love aspen, um, but also willow and cottonwood and things like that. And they'll chew and they'll cut down whatever they're looking for. And then instead of like dragging it back over land, which would be really hard or to try to carry it, which they can't do, even though they're pretty huge, um, they put the wood in the water and the wood is naturally buoyant. So it floats and then they float it back like little tiny loggers um, and take it back to their dam, back to their home pond. And then they build with it and they eat it. Um, and so they definitely are using these canals for themselves and for wood and other materials like that. Interesting. Hi, this is this is Bob. Um, I'm I'm wondering how um, beaver reintroduction is being is happening around the country. Is it happening anywhere or besides here in Estes Park? Yeah, it is. Um, so beaver reintroduction is happening in a lot of places around the country. It's really taking off in the American West, especially. Uh, some of the leaders in beaver reintroductions are the Tulalip tribe in Washington. They've been doing this for a long time, um, specifically to help with drought and climate issues with a lot of success. And so they run a training program to teach other people how to relocate beavers successfully, which is really, I think, an incredible resource. Um, they do it in Oregon as well, in South Dakota, Idaho. Uh, lots of relocations happen in Utah at Utah State University. They have a beaver ecology relocation center where they not only move the beavers but then also study ways to make those relocations more successful um, think about how long do you quarantine a beaver before moving it to make sure it doesn't bring any sort of a disease into its new habitat do you have to move them during a specific month of the year or is it like a couple of months you have so lots of work out of there um, it happens in colorado a lot too uh, the permitting process in colorado is pretty lengthy though so you have to be really thinking about your relocation pretty far ahead of time to be able to do it uh, above board um, but relocation is a really good option for places that are sort of de-beavered and having a hard time recovering they're also a good option if all efforts at sort of um, coexistence have failed and that I think it's a lot easier and more successful to install pond levelers or wrap your trees with wire or do what you can to coexist with the beavers but sometimes that's just not going to work um, especially if they're like directly flooding someone's house and that's the perfect time pick that beaver up pick its whole family up and put it somewhere that really needs them and wants them especially these big public lands and open spaces We've got a comment from, well, it just disappeared. Do you have that, Willen? I was going to read it. Um, Carla Henderson thank you, said, thank you. It was an amazing presentation. I agree. Yeah, I agree. thank you. Great. So, um, and I know there are, there are quite a few resources available for people to, if the beaver coexistence is not something that works out right. So where, where would somebody go, I guess, if they were if they were needing to uh, relocate a beaver? <laughs> if you're at your wit's end. Um, so it's going to vary a lot based on where you're at in the state and which county you're in. Um, there's some general resources you can reach out to. So in Colorado, Defenders of Wildlife helps with a lot of the relocation programs. Um, they do a lot out of Denver and the Denver area into the foothills, but they would definitely know who does it. Um, in the rest of the state, if nothing else. I know it's a little bit different depending on who's in charge of the watershed and who's issuing those permits. I, I have one question for you. Um, you showed a lot of different examples of beaver habitat. Do you have any estimated or estimate on the age or how old or how long those areas had been around before the fires? So in both of the fires in Colorado, they'd been dammed for quite a while. Um, I could see like the Cameron Peak one that I visited on ground and took all those photos at, that beaver dam had been there since the 90s at least. That was the earliest um, aerial image I had access to and it was fully built then. So it was probably there for decades before that, just being maintained by family after family, generation after generation. You see that pretty often in places where they're not being pestered by people. Um, in East Troublesome, it was a little bit more variable if the dam had been there consistently for decades, but the areas that they were in had been dammed for decades. And so maybe they moved from this dam to that dam a half a kilometer downstream and then moved back a few years later. So the dams are kind of go in and out of repair, which is a really normal thing for that to happen in the landscape with beavers. Um, but overall it had been 
pretty consistently dammed. One of the things that I have seen in places where the beavers are a lot newer is that the newer beaver ponds are less fire resistant than the older beaver ponds. And so that's another reason to really work with the beavers that are in place if you can. Um, but if not, like the best time to start is now. <laughs> um, get them there so that in five years, that is an old beaver pond and there is a lot of water stored. And I'm sure that if you have a really good water year right after the beaver builds its dam, that's gonna be more fireproof than if you have a drought year right after the beaver builds its dam because it does need to store water to have some of that fire resistance effect. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I guess a follow-up question, um, we talk about BDAs or beaver dam analogs how those are the human built or human engineered beaver dams how um resilient are those to fire versus they, a real beaver dam <laughs> less um it, it has not been studied as much um partially because building bdas sort of at scale the way that beavers build their dams at scale is really new um, we used to be like a project here and there with like 10 BDAs or five BDAs. And now we're starting to see projects where entire watersheds, you know, 300 BDAs get put in to really do some large scale restoration. And I guess we're just waiting for them to burn, um, which is a horrible thing to say, but it's kind of the reality of this field. Um, there were BDAs in the Dixie fire before it burned in California. And I was just talking to some of the people that built them and they're up there right now, sort of evaluating the aftermath of Dixie. And it looks like some of their BDAs did create fire refugia. And so we had patches of greenery around the BDA, um, the exact size of that. And if it occurs, you know, 100% of the time or 80% of the time or 50% of the time, we don't have numbers on it yet. But I am hopeful that if you have enough BDAs that you really kickstart that restoration process in the river, that the natural river processes that increase resilience can sort of start playing a role as well. Would it be better with beavers? Probably. I mean, they spread out the water so much and they do all of this engineering that is actually like a lot of labor, um, but it's not binary. It's not like beavers, no burning, no beavers, lots of burning. Um, you can definitely get that middle ground with the BDAs where you have less burning and more resilience just because you've kickstarted the river's natural processes. Great. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Um, I have one more question, Emily. This is Celeste. I'm looking at your video of beaver dam, beaver dam, beaver dam. And you said earlier that one family builds multiple beaver dams. Why? What are they getting out of it? What's the return to them? They build lots of beaver dams because they like to have their own insurance policy on disasters. Um, except they can't hire an insurance company to pay for things when it goes wrong. So they build more dams around their home pond. So they have one pond that they really live in pretty much full time. And that's where they build their lodge or their bank den. And then both upstream and downstream, they build what are called secondary dams. And those are often smaller dams or shorter dams. And they're just there to be more speed bumps for the water. They make more habitat. And if there's a flood, hopefully the five dams you built upstream will blow out one by one by one. Um, or breach one by one by one, but slowing the water down and taking that power out of it so that when it finally gets to the home pond, it's not so destructive that it can blow that one out too. And uh -huh. I've seen that happen here in California. We've got some beavers that are on a pretty flashy river and there was a huge flood, like nine inches of rain in a day. And it came in and it blew their secondary. It got to their primary pond and it just overtopped it. It didn't blow it out because it had just, lo lo just lost enough power that it was not a destructive flood wave anymore. And then the beavers fixed everything up within a week and it was back to its normal state. Huh. Similarly with droughts and fires, the more aquatic habitat they've created, the more space they're gonna be able to occupy once that disaster is over or while that disaster is ongoing. Hmm. But this has been fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Uh, do I we agree. have more questions, Willen? I don't see any more questions in the chat. Everybody, it's very appreciative, though. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, we thank you so much. This was just really enlightening for all of us in Colorado, and maybe uh, others are chiming in as well. Anyway, thank you for coming, Emily. And um, I was just writing. Uh, our, our uh, president of the board saying, we need to have you back when you've collected <laughs> even more data. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Bob, did you have something you want to ask? 
Oh, I was just thinking our experiences in the in the chili camp would be interesting to study down the road. Yes. For somebody. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, many thanks. Have a good night. And um, our next uh, talk will be on Thursday, July 21st. It's up on your screen. Again at night, but this time it's in it's in person, it's live at the community center and it will be taped as well, right, Willen? Okay, will be taped as well. And it's about gray wolves in Colorado. Um, all about the before, after uh, re reintroduction that was voted on last fall. So we'll see what happens. And Gary Miller, who is a wildlife biologist, will tell us all about it. He'll bring it up to date. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you in a month. Thanks, this is great.